In one of the most famous fake quotes in history, Stalin allegedly said that one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. Now, Stalin actually never said this. This is a fake quote, but I like it because it captures something. Sometimes when you want to portray, to explain, to show how big something is, you have to make it specific. You have to relate it to real people, to concrete stories. So it is not enough to say Stalin was bad or Stalin killed millions. In this video, we will see four stories which actually concretize how bad Stalin was. It will depict the magnitude of his evil and its impact on real specific people. Now notice, this is not a video with Stalin's top hits of evil. For example, it will not cover perhaps his biggest crime, which was the forced collectivization of agriculture from 1929 till the early 1930s, which had as a result around 5 million deaths and the enslavement of tens of uh, millions of peasants. Or it will not cover the subjugation of Eastern Europe after World War II or his role in the Korean War. These are crimes, but these are crimes that make sense, we could say, for a communist dictator. It makes sense that a communist dictator wants to collectivize the land. This is essential for communism. Or it makes sense that the leader of an expanding power with visions of international dominations will have an imperialistic role. But the four examples I'm going to give actually don't even make sense from the point of view of a dictator. These are examples that your rank and file dictator would not do. These are examples of evil quite particular to Stalin. First example of incomprehensible evil, of evil that does not make sense. The Great Terror, the Great Purge that peaked from 1936 till 1938. Now, it is normal for dictatorships to persecute their opponents. It is normal for the secret police of a dictatorship to arrest people from the opposition and then to torture them so that they reveal the truth. Things such as who are with you in the opposition, where have you hidden weapons. These are things that are horrible, but are to be expected from every dictatorship. Under Stalin, we saw something different. Once he got rid of everyone who was an actual opposition, and this happened quite early in the years of the regime, Stalin was mostly persecuting loyal communists, not the opponents of the regime, but the closest allies of the regime his comrades with whom he did the revolution, uh, the coup actually, in 1917, the people who helped him build Soviet Union. And the secret police was not after people who hid some information that they needed in order to uncover a conspiracy. The secret police, with orders straight from the top, from Stalin and his inner circle, was arresting and torturing people on charges that everyone knew that they were made up charges, on charges that everyone knew that were completely fantastic and farcical. And they were torturing them not to reveal the truth, but to play along with this script, with these farcical accusations. And what was the result of the Great Purge? By the end of the Great Terror, Around 800,000 people were executed or they died during interrogations at the hands of the NKVD. There were around 1.6 million people in the concentration camps, in gulags, and soon there would be more. And there were 350,000 people in prisons. To put it simply, one third of the party members, the people again who did the revolution, who built that state, the first communist state in history, they perished during the purges. The purges were particularly harsh in the army. More than 500 out of 767 of the high commanders of Red Army, 8 out of 9 admirals, 13 out of 15 generals, and 3 out of 5 marshals were executed. And in the archives, we have found many desperate letters that they sent from the torture chambers to 
the leadership of the army that uh, survived, or even to Stalin himself, saying, what is happening here? We fought together. Please do something. We're being tortured. We're innocent. We, we would die for this regime. Why are we being persecuted? Why are we being destroyed? There is no rational explanation for why the Great Purges happened. And here is how the New York Times reporting on the time on what was taking place. On one after the other, the great heroes of the revolution perishing and being publicly ridiculed and humiliated in these show trials, they described it as follows. Quote, It is as if 20 years after Yorktown, somebody in power at Washington found it necessary for the safety of the state to send to the scaffold Thomas Jefferson, Madison, John Adams, Hamilton, Jay, and most of their associates. The charge against them would be that they conspired to hand over the United States to George III. So during the Great Purges, during the Great Terror, the most dangerous country in the world to be a communist was, ironically, Soviet Union. What was the role of Stalin in all this? Well, it was quite central. He signed lists with names that should be purged. He actually gave direct orders for some of his old friends, for some of his old comrades to be tortured. And he knew 100% that all this was on made up charges. Personally, among all the evil that I have studied and examined, the Great Purges is the biggest mystery. The Holocaust is horrible, it's something horrendous, but it makes sense from the point of view of evil. So Hitler hated the Jews, he had as a plan to exterminate them, and he did so. It's unspeakable, perhaps unique in history evil, but it makes sense. Of course, understanding is different from justifying, but we can comprehend it. The Great Terror, it's difficult to comprehend, it's difficult to understand why it happened. A second example of Stalin's incomprehensible evil. How he treated people who were close to him. So there were the people who were close to him and perished in the purges. We discussed this already, but there were also people who were close to him. They were not purged, but still he destroyed them by going after the thing that was most precious to them. And this was their wives. We see this theme in Stalin destroying, sometimes literally destroying through torture or through execution, the wives of those around him. He used this as a means to control them, as a means to create an atmosphere of fear. Your guess is as good as mine. But the fact is that he did it. And I find this, again, incomprehensible. How you treat those that have been most loyal to you is a sign of character. I don't think there has been any other dictator in history who was so disloyal to those who were loyal to him. But let's speak with specific examples. Throughout the history of the Soviet Union, who was the person who was closest to Stalin? Probably Vyacheslav Molotov. He was his foreign minister. He was a yes man. He was someone who always agreed with Stalin. And yet, after the Second World War, after the country has gone through an existential threat. And after Molotov has been by his side throughout all these years, Stalin decides to go after the wife of Molotov. His wife was Polina Zemzutsina. In 1948, she's arrested for treason. And again, everyone knows that this is made up. Stalin knows this is made up. Molotov knows this is made up. And his wife knows that this is made up. Her fate is that she sent for five years to the Gulag. Uh, she survived, though. Another person who was very important to Stalin was Alexander Posgriobisev. He was something like his personal secretary, but secretary undermines what he was doing. He was running all his affairs. He was the person that stood between Stalin and the rest of the inner Circle. How did Stalin show his appreciation to his colleague? In 1939, the beloved wife of Poskriobisev is accused to be a Trotskyite. And of course, such an accusation was a fast way to your destruction. 
πως Κριόπισεφς wife is not just arrested, she is actually executed in 1939. And this is why in this photo you only see πως Κριόπισεφ with his kids. The photo is from the early 1940s. His wife is not anymore there. She's been executed. Again, Stalin allows, if not initiates, the execution of the most important person in the life of someone who was among the most important persons in his own life. One more example of Stalin going after the wife of one of his closest people. The nominal head of state in Soviet Union was not Stalin, it was Mikhail Kalinin. It was someone who had no real power, but he was with Stalin again from the beginning of the revolution, actually from before the beginning of the revolution, throughout thick and thin. And how does Stalin say thank you for this? In 1938, his wife is arrested with the accusation of being a Trotsky. At that point, her husband was the head of the presidium of the Soviet Union. So it was the highest title that you could have in that state. And yet, she's tortured, she's not executed, she survives, and after the war, after having spent years in the Gulag, she's released. But this was a very strong statement that even if you hold the highest office, and even if you're someone who has been close to me, I'm going to not only, again, threaten your family, I mean, the mafia does this. The mafia threatens other people's family. Stalin doesn't stay at the level of threat. He acts on it and he tortures this woman and this woman spends all these years in a labor camp. And of course, Kalinin, he can't do anything else. He stays loyal to Stalin. There's something very dark going after the wives of the people who are close to you. It's, it's this sadistic political cuckolding. And again, these were people who did not pose any threat to Stalin. Molotov was a yes man. Kalinin was a yes man. They would never, ever dream of rising up against Stalin. And yet he did what he did. Now, of course, the biggest victims of this brutality were these women themselves. But also think of what this did to their men. Imagine visiting your woman when she's in prison, when she's in the torture chambers of the NKVD. Imagine her asking you, first of all, why am I going through this? And second, you're supposedly one of the most powerful men in the country. How can you not help me? How can you not do something for me? Imagine what this would do to the pride of these men, to their self-esteem, to their manhood. And also imagine how sadistic one must be to conceive of such a way to torture and humiliate them. And yet Stalin did it. Of particular evil is this third point in Stalin's top hits of evil that is difficult to explain. And this is the notion of collective responsibility. Collective responsibility means that someone is guilty by association. I would put guilty in quotation marks because these people were actually, even the people they associated with, they were not guilty of anything. Now, most people associate collective responsibility with the Nazis, but actually it was very prominent also in Soviet Union. And it manifested itself in two ways. One is that collective responsibility applied to the families of people who fell in the purges. Quite often this happened informally, So in order to threat someone who was arrested, if he wouldn't succumb after the torture and wouldn't sign whatever was put in front of him to admit that he's a traitor or a Trotskyite or a fascist or whatever, the next level would be to threaten his family. But quite often, his family was also arrested. Particularly horrible is the story of a high army official called Frivovsky in 1938, When he fell out of grace during the Great Terror, his wife was arrested and his son was also arrested. His son was still only 17. And here's the most horrible part. They were all executed, but they were executed in reverse order with Frivovsky dying the last. So first his son was executed, then his wife was executed, and then after a few days, he was executing. And this is something the regime did quite often. 
the people they wanted to destroy the most, they would execute them last because they would want them to see, to experience, to witness the execution of other people so that the agony would be bigger. This was sadism for its own sake. Now, someone could say, well, this might be a coincidence or maybe there was something against the families of these, of these people. Maybe it wasn't a targeted policy of collective responsibility. But actually it was. And how do we know? On the 5th of July of 1937, Stalin and Yezov, Yezov at that point was the head of the secret police, they signed a decree that says that there will be gulag sentences for the family members, for the wives of those who were already liquidated and were of some importance for the party as victims that they wanted to showcase. Collective responsibility was also widespread when it came to ethnic groups. During the purges, different ethnic groups were targeted for supposed collaboration with outside the enemy forces. So one in six ethnic Poles, people of Polish origin, were liquidated together with many other ethnicities. Other groups included the Latvians, ethnic Germans, Uyghur students and also Iranians of the southern territories because they were close to Iran and Stalin supposedly had the suspicion that they might become the fifth phalanx of a foreign force. So here we see the madness. On the one hand, Stalin destroying the defensive capability of his country by going after the heads of the army, by going after the secret services, by going after military intelligence, and at the same time, supposedly being afraid of a foreign intervention, going after ethnic minorities. Did this serve any actual political purpose? Again, no. This is sadism and collectivism unleashed. The individual does not matter. The only thing that exists are groups. This group now we have decided is bad. Therefore, every individual who is part of this group is fair game. The fourth incomprehensible evil by Stalin is one that had a particular impact on me when I still was a communist. I remember being able to rationalize many of the crimes of Stalin. I would say all their imperialistic propaganda, or uh, maybe he had his reasons. Maybe these people were indeed uh, enemies of the people, the ones who perished in the purges. But this particular one, I never wanted to believe it. I always wanted to forget it. And yet today we know 100% it was true. And this is how Stalin treated the German communists that came as refugees to Soviet Union. Many of them perished during the purges, but those who did not perish, there was an even worse fate for them. He handed them back to the Nazis after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 1939. Or as we should call it, the Hitler-Stalin Pact of 1939. So there were many German communists who, when Hitler came to power, escaped to Soviet Union. Now picture this. These people, their whole life they fought for communism. These people found a new country in Soviet Union and they considered it their country. These people again would die for Stalin, would die for Soviet Union, would die for communism. And what does Stalin do to them? He literally hands them on a silver plate to Hitler. Now picture this. Picture these people getting in a train, knowing that at the other side, the Gestapo, the Nazis, wait for them. How cynical must you be in order to break this pact of honor that you should have, that at least we don't let our own down. We don't let any of our own behind. And Stalin not only does not do that, he's handing them to the Nazis. Some particularly tragic cases are people who experience the persecutions, both in Soviet Union and then in Nazi Germany. An example is Margarete Buber Neumann. She was a prisoner of the NKVD. Her husband was persecuted, he was purged, he disappeared. She never found out during her lifetime what had happened to him, although later we found out he was executed during the purges. So the Soviet secret police arrests 
and uh, mistreats her and imprisons her. And then one day she enters a train to go back to Germany to be handed to the Nazis, to the Gestapo, and to suffer in the hands of a second horrible dictatorship. And she narrates her uh, tragic experience in a book she wrote with recollections. Here's a crazy fact which is quite telling about the fate of German communists. There were more Politburo members of the German Communist Party who perished under the communists, under the Stalinist purges, than those who perished and died under the Nazis. Again, the Soviet Union was the most dangerous place on earth for being a communist during the time of Stalin and of the Great Purges. Now, a final question is why did Stalin did all this? Many people give the easy answer that he was a psychopath, he was a sociopath, he, something was wrong with his mind. And Stephen Kotkin, who is the best scholar when it comes to Stalin, he says something with which I agree. He says, if indeed there was something wrong with Stalin, people would have noticed earlier in his life. Stalin was in his late 40s when he came to power. He was in his 50s when the purges uh, took place, in his late 50s, actually. So if something was wrong with him, people would have noticed earlier. So here is the explanation about his behavior that Kotkin gives. The only type of person who can run a communist is someone with the violent and sadistic characteristics that we saw Stalin have. And also it's the opposite. Running a country like a communist dictatorship develops these violent, sadistic traits. Put differently, Stalin created the Soviet Union, but also the Soviet Union in a way created Stalin. Of course, this is not to take anything away from his guilt. He had free will. It's not that he was determined to do so. But it takes that type of person and only that type of person to run a country with the collectivistic characteristics of Soviet Union. I have all the respect in the world for Kotkin, but for me the mystery remains. Why did Stalin have to do all this? They went beyond the survival of Soviet Union or they went beyond the brutality that anyway he showed for the building of communism. Why he had to show the sadism is a mystery that perhaps will remain unresolved. And maybe we'll never be able to understand it. But we have to understand this. An ideology that puts the collective above the individual, an ideology that has no respect for the sanctity of every individual, for every individual life, such a country can very easily fall prey to violence like the one we saw from Soviet Union. Every such regime is one Stalin away from ex or one Mao away or one Pol Pot away from experience these horrors that we saw. So maybe we'll never be able to understand Stalin, but let's at least understand this lesson. The lesson is that collectivism kills. And by the time it starts doing so, if you have accepted this ideology, you can't do anything. Part of the reason why these people close to Stalin did not react when he destroyed their lives or humiliated them was part of it was fear, but also they understood that they themselves thought that, yeah, they didn't matter really. They were just individuals. They were cogs into this biggest collectivist machine that the one does not matter. What matters is the many. What matters is the group. What matters is the collective. What matters is the Soviet Union. And this idea, I find it more evil even than Stalin's sadism. Thank you for watching.